Welcome to Game Design 100B. This is the second of a series of lectures designed for the professional development for faculty members of the Naval War College's Wargaming Department. I'm Pete Pellegrino, a member of the department, uh, and if you saw 100A, you know my background. Uh, I'm a lead game designer, primarily for the Title X series of games at the college. Uh, game Design 100B basically just gives the new faculty member a sense for the history of wargaming. Uh, the War College is the longest continuing wargaming organization in the United States. Uh, we trace our roots back to 1887 for our first war games here. But to get a bigger sense of the historical uh, scope of wargaming, to get a sense for the, the larger historical overview for wargaming, um, we'll look at Go, chess, early games, because chess particularly has a strong influence in the nature of the development of wargaming as we practice it now. Uh, we'll talk about the Prussians, uh, as we kind of joke about who else would come up with rigid uh, wargaming structures but uh, the Prussians. Uh, we'll talk about Livermore, McCarty. Uh, these are figures who we credit with bringing wargaming from Europe to the United States and bringing it here to specifically to the Naval War College. We'll talk about a few other figures uh, who are important in the development of wargaming here at the college. Uh, wargaming through the 20th century, how it changes over time at the college, and what we're doing right now and how that all kind of ties our history together. Uh, the first earliest descriptions that we found of Go, uh, it goes back to Chinese literature back in uh, 548 BC. Uh, Go is a very simple strategy game in terms of its rules. Um, and as I say, it's easy to learn, but it takes a lifetime to master. Chess, most likely originating out of India, although there is a strong Islamic influence in chess. Uh, sometime around the 6th century. And it's chess particularly, because of its checkerboard arrangement, that has a strong influence on early wargaming. That's why you tend to call this early period of wargaming, the 1600s and 1700s, military chess. Because the boards are very much so influenced by the checkerboard pattern of chess and the idea of an abstracted military conflict going on on those boards. Um, Koingenspiel is found in literature in Germany in 1664. Um, and it really kind of just basically, looks, you, you look at the board and you think it's chess. It's just chess on steroids and that the board's a little bigger and there are more pieces than uh, modern chess rules. Realizing that modern chess, as we know it today, basically comes out of the Middle Ages, uh, about 1200s, is when the pieces kind of settle down to what we play with today. Uh, 1780, Dr. Helwig takes the board and makes it quite a bit bigger. Uh, we're talking about, about 1,600 uh, squares. Um, and on both sides, all the pieces are numbered about 240 pieces. The important part, though, with Hellway's game is the terrain. Previously, we we're still talking about basically a, a two-color board, you know, and the squares were there purely to, to delineate positional movement. Hellwig introduces the idea of terrain in that we have blue squares for water, you know, dark green squares for forest, light green squares for, for plain. Um, and with the size of the board, there's the idea of an umpire being introduced. So it's not just the two players, but we've got this third party umpire. And this third party umpire will become more important later. Uh, the game is starting to spread now in popularity, uh, France, Austria, and Italy. Then uh, a couple years later, we have uh, Venerini uh, developing even a larger one, uh, although this one is the new war game, it's 3,600 squares. But the differences are now the terrain is actually modeled after real world terrain. Veterini's game is basically set along the French-Belgian border. So he's trying to replicate features in the real world on the game board, which prior to this point, we have a much more abstracted game. Now we have a very specific piece of terrain we're trying to, to capture. Um, we're also adding pieces like logistics pieces to the board, to, to the game as well. And the pieces are becoming a little less abstract and a little more realistic in terms of identifiable units, artillery, logistics, cavalry, infantry, etc. Um, now, while this is all going on on the continent, uh, we've got John Clerk, an Englishman, uh, who breaks off the chessboard. So, from this perspective, uh, de Clerk is, or Clerk rather is unique in, in two ways. One, he's not using a chessboard. Why? Because he's using naval forces. So he gets away from the chessboard problem because he's dealing with the tabletop flat ocean. But what Clerk figures out is that. Naval forces can move in very predictable, 
physics, physically controlled geometry. I mean, we can work out. We know the turning radius of a frigate. We know the rate of advance in a five knot wind. This is physics. So, Clerk is able to develop a series of tables and movement rules to be able to describe the movement of a little fleet on a tabletop. Now, we're thinking, yeah, okay, so what? This is radical for the 1700s, in part because Clerk's never been to sea. Okay, he's never stepped foot on board a ship. Yet, he is able to model and simulate the movement of fleets at sea on a tabletop. Using this kind of approach to be able to now, I can, uh, naval commanders can investigate different formations. We can experiment a bit with much more freedom than we could if we actually had to put ships to sea to work this out. Um, and part of Nelson's thinking of, its, of his formation at Tr Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 is influenced by previous clerk gaming uh, studies using clerk's little model ships on tabletop. So we've got clerk going on. Uh, breaking the chessboard in that way, and that he's not even he doesn't care about using a gridded surface to regulate movement. We're just going to use physics and geometry to regulate movement. The other big change is the Dutch finally figure out how to do contour lines. So now I can start representing terrain even more to more detail than Venerini was. With just at least I'm trying to replicate the Belgian border, but I'm still kind of working from a flat flat Earth perspective, flat water. Yeah, that I have a square here that says I'm a hill, but it's fairly abstract. The Dutch now have come up with the contour line concept. And so now we can actually start making flat, but terrain and elevation impacted maps, which are going to provide the alternative to the generic checkerboard playing surface that everyone's been playing on up to this point. Um, the Kriegspiel game, uh, which is, is, is fairly commonly discussed, in the kind of the history of wargaming is kind of like the, the grand progenitor of, of wargaming that follows. Um, Baron von Reiswitz comes up with the game in 1811. And again, now we've moved from charts, so he's actually using a sand table. Heaping up sand, in part using the contour information he can get from Dutch charts to be able to make a model of a particular piece of battlefield. And what he does is he's more interested in the movement and positioning of forces going from column march to line of breast to deploying a firing line. So when he makes his pieces, he makes them such that their frontage is accurate. So if a line of infantry takes up so many hundreds of yards, it's scale proportion on a block of wood that's that many yards wide. So Ricewitz's game is very much so about maneuver. Less so about combat, but much more about maneuver. So he's playing around with this Kriegspiel concept. And uh, King Frederick III of Prussia is fascinated by the idea. And he invites Reichswitz to the palace to show off his game. Reichswitz figures, well, he can't show up with this dumb sandbox thing he's got with his little wooden pieces that's unsuitable for the king. So he spends months building this beautiful uh, table setup. And we actually got some, uh, some pictures here of a, of a similar uh, Kriegspiel table. Porcelain figures. Um, these little terrain pieces, which he can construct different uh, terrain with. It's all done in porcelain, uh, beautiful pieces. Uh, but again, very much so about a, a maneuver game. All the rules tend to be focused on how to move forces, not, okay, when they come into contact, then what? So here we can see that this is one uh, Kriegspiel table, uh, it's dated 1812. Uh, the translation on the side of the table is tactical Kriegspiel table. But again, you can see that it's quite a piece of furniture. Uh, it has these composable terrain pieces that allow you to recreate uh, any type of surface. Uh, and you've got your collection of all the different pieces, and again, equipment, dividers, rulers, etc., to support play. This composable terrain idea, by the way, uh, is still found in games now. Uh, Settlers of Catan, a very popular European board game, crossover the United States, uses this sense of composable terrain so that the game board is never the same twice. Uh, Hasbro has a game. A HeroScape, which uses plastic hex pieces that can be stacked and represent water, hills, mountains. Uh, again, it's the sense of being able to compose your terrain, like you see here in this uh, example from 200 years ago. Now, the son of uh, Reiswitz, so we call this son of Kriegspiel, uh, Lieutenant George von Reiswitz, uh, decides, okay, the table is nice, it's cool, but it doesn't exactly travel well to camp. So it's kind of a cumbersome device to use 
for military training in camps. And the game is very, very popular amongst the troops. So he goes and uses that Dutch topography technique. So you start using a topographical chart in lieu of the table for the game surface. And now the rules get expanded to actually do with the combat part, because I mean, prior to this, we're all about maneuver. Uh, now, with the addition of the combat rules, the rule book is getting pretty thick, and the game is getting pretty complicated. So uh, Colonel Von Verde, uh, 1876, basically goes to what we talked about in an earlier brief, uh, the 100 Alpha series, the free assessment. So rather than having the rigid assessment using the rules concept, he brings in umpire to basically do free assessment, thereby trying to free up some of the overhead for conducting the game. And obviously the free assessment is something we continue now. So that's all going on over in Europe 